Number 10. Jessica Jones Jessica Jones, aka Jewel, but only for a very brief moment, is low on here, cause when she got pregnant she was still a private eye, and keeping pretty distant from the superhero community. Jessica Jones debuted in Alias Number 1, the first comic for Marvel's then at the time new Marvel Max imprint. She had been a superheroine whose career was cut short after a disastrous encounter with the Purple Man, who after growing tired of her, sent her off to attack the Avengers, with emphasis on Daredevil. The Avengers proceeded to beat her into a coma, just assuming she'd gone full villain, and when she came out of it, she retired from superhero life. Alias is as much about Jessica's recovery as the mystery she is solving in it. She enters a relationship with Scott Lang, but ends up cheating on him with her close friend Luke Cage, and getting pregnant. When Scott found out, he was, well, he was upset, and he left her. But Jessica was in a good place. She had faced the Purple Man head on, escaped his control, and not killed him. That was a big deal for her in the comics. It made her feel like she was still a hero and still held justice above vengeance. Also, she was gonna get with Luke Cage. Hooray! But yeah, pregnant and later Squirrel Girl would be her and Luke's nanny. Good times. Number 9. Batgirl. We're talking about Barbara Gordon and the DCAU comic verse, so the DC animated universe extended comic universe. Here we have to look at the Batman Beyond continuity, wherein the reader finally gets a a glimpse into the falling out between Barbara, Dick, and Bruce. While Dick was away, Bruce and Barbara had, well, a fling. It's implied a bit more than that, but it resulted in her getting pregnant, and in the time frame that there is no way she could pass it off as Dick's. Ultimately, she would actually lose the baby after a particularly tough street fight. It would cause her to miscarry. It's a very grim and gritty plot that not everyone took to. It's very hard to be sympathetic to Bruce in it after it. Like, oof, this is worse than the rooftop in the animated Killing Joke adaptation, and that's saying a lot. Number 8. Selena Kyle Selena Kyle, aka Catwoman, often skirts the line of anti-hero and thief, but her reforming is a common plot point, and her pregnancy pre-New 52 was part of her path towards trying to be a hero. This was an interesting nod to the past Huntress continuity, where the Huntress had been Bruce and Selena's daughter. The nod is that the baby here is named Helena Kyle, but she's not Batman's daughter. Daughter, she's Sam Bradley's, but he dies the day Selena finds out that she's pregnant, so Bruce ends up being pretty supportive of this whole affair. But he ultimately helps Selena place Helena up for adoption, when she feels that she can't keep her safe because of her life is Catwoman. She would then ask Zatanna to wipe her mind, but Zatanna would say no, which I find hilarious because I mean identity crisis, she was super cool to wipe minds, her friends, but not this time. This is the line. Number 7. Spoiler. Stephanie Brown. Her pregnancy storyline is famous. It occurred in 1998 and was praised for realism and the audacity to tackle such a topic in comics. This happened in Robin's comic series, the Robin in question being Tim Drake. At this point, Spoiler was an accepted vigilante in Gotham, but not on good enough terms with the Bat family to be in the inner circle, despite dating Tim. She would find out that she was pregnant with her ex-boyfriend's baby, and he was no longer in town. Despite not revealing himself, Tim would support her using an alias by taking her to Lamaze classes and the like. Stephanie decided to carry the child to term and give them up for adoption, somewhere hopefully away from Gotham for a better life. Intense stuff, people. The 90s weren't all shoulder guns and pouches. Number 6. Power Girl so this was a plot that has slipped under the radar for some, also coming to us from the 90s, but not as well handled or poignant as spoilers. Here we have Power Girl, who would be shown hooking up with Parallax, White, Reed Richards, Hair Streaks, Hal Jordan, and two issues later suddenly be in full-blown pregnancy symptoms, you know, the ones that happen in media. Dizzy, nauseous, food smells. And then all of a sudden she would blurt out mid-flight in a panel that definitely would have been memed if it had come out today, I think I'm pregnant. You know, there's a reason people don't go around yelling this, there are many causes for nausea and dizziness and you wouldn't yell those out. I think I have the flu. So is Hal the father? No. This is one of those immaculate conceptions. And oh man, this plot goes places. Like then she's all, I'm not pregnant, but that version of her was a robot. And the real version was pregnant. Then Hal was convinced she was lying to him about not being the dad, and so she punched him in the face, and he was all, let me be a dad, and she was all, no, this is a virginal conception. Also, then her baby had powers from within the womb, so she could still kind of keep fighting. She ended up being sidelined during Zero Hour, but okay. Who was the dad? It was Arion, and he impregnated her without her consent, so she would give birth to a perfect being. In what way is that better than it being Hal's? The baby would become Equinox, and where is he now? 
MIA. Number five, Tigra. Tigra would find herself pregnant during the initiative storyline when she entered into a relationship with Yellow Jacket Hank Pym. But she would discover she was pregnant after the Skrull invasion, where Hank had been revealed to be a Skrull. So she had to wonder, was it his baby or a Skrull baby? I mean, maybe it would be better if it was a Skrull baby. Hank has a lot of issues. Tigra initially decided that she was going to abort the baby either way, but her cat-like physiology would allow her to carry the baby to term in two months. And so she would give birth to said cat baby. And the Skrull was the real father, by the way. I feel like Maury, this may be my favorite video. I have no idea what that says about me. The baby was named William, and Tigra was initially very lukewarm about his entire existence. Also, since it's a Skrull baby, genetically it was still Hank's anyway, because that's the level of copying we're talking about here, people. She would warm up to William eventually, I mean, look at the little cat baby. And he would mature faster than your average baby as well. Number four, Quasar. Yes, Quasar got pregnant, and he had a dramatic cover which said, Mama never said there'd be days like this, which is a reference to a song which is from 1961. So it would already have been a bit out of date and left field as a reference when this came out, which was 1991. So Quasar was impregnated by her, or Aisha, if you know we have to name her. She wanted to have perfect babies with him, or just someone. Really, she wanted to have babies with him, the him being Adam Warlock, but he was not down. So she was like, fine, I'll just inject heroes with my reproductive pods to see who's worthy. Not okay, people. Not okay. People and entities and forces need to stop doing this. It's not a good look. Of all the heroes she would forcefully inseminate, Quasar is the only one who doesn't try to forcibly remove it, and is kind of just like, okay, and keeps on fighting for her and everything. This was largely played for comedy, which I don't know, is that better or worse than just not knowing why it's squicky? Having your body violated against your consent. Hilarious. But he got the same homage to Demi Moore cover as the She-Hulk did, so. Worth it? Number three, Spider Woman, Jessica Drew. Jessica Drew's pregnancy was a huge plot point for her. She would continue to fight crime throughout while pregnant, but she would have a special force field belt for her stomach, so it's fine. Sure, Jan. There would be a whole who's the dad question here as well, and the answer is some guy. She would artificially inseminate herself because she wanted to be a mom. This was a shift for her character, as initially she had seemed to imply that she wasn't interested in motherhood. But people change, things happen. Her whole pregnancy would be all about how, yeah, she could do it all. Which, okay, yes, nice mom power. As someone who has been pregnant, even if your pregnancy is amazing, you still can't do it all. And that's not a bad thing or a weakness, just a reality. There's another person in there. Her taking time off wouldn't have made her less of a hero and implying that it would have, well. Okay, so after having the baby, she would suffer from separation anxiety and wrestle with going back to being Spider-Woman at all. But then she would decide that she would so she could be a good example. Number two, Ms. Marvel. Yes, this is number two, shock and awe. So this storyline is infamous at this point. Miss Marvel would find herself impregnated against her will by her lover who had altered her mind to make her want him, so, so rape, so that he could give birth to himself. This occurred in Avengers 200. Now some have come out after all of the hail of criticisms against this comic being like, it's not that bad. But here's the thing, no one in the story reacts normally here. Her teammates are congratulating her, like what? No, she has no idea how this happened or why, and she's terrified, and they're like, yeah. Also, it's a scary hyper-pregnancy, and then the baby hyper-ages and becomes her lover, and then she goes off with him, and they accept it. And yet, no, no one questions her about it. This is probably just writer oversight. Like, no one thought about the implications, because perhaps they were outside of their viewpoints or own experiences, which doesn't have to be an issue, but can be if the writer doesn't even think to acknowledge it. So later, she would come back and yell at the team after fan backlash. Some are like, see, it's fine. But this was a retcon only after people complained. Her being mind controlled to give birth to the man who raped her. Totally fine. Number one, the invisible woman. Yes, she's over Miss Marvel. Sue Storm, the invisible woman, would be the first woman to become a mom and superhero in comics. So an iconic pregnancy. She would take a break and then come back, you know, like life. Her second pregnancy would be very dramatic, however. In fact, the first time it would not come to fruition and the baby would die because of Sue's exposure to radiation in the negative zone. It was a really sad plot line. In fact, for some fans, too sad. And it would be retconned very convoluted 
unmutedly, so get excited. This pregnancy would be saved by Franklin Richards and his terrifying godlike powers. He would place the baby in an alternate future timeline, where after encountering a Marvel girl from another timeline where she is the daughter of Sue and Doom, she would be reverted to a baby and replaced in the womb of Sue, but allegedly be the original stillborn baby, who Doctor Doom would then help Sue give birth to and name Valeria, the same name that Marvel Girl had in that alternate timeline. The point is, she would have the baby. Hooray! Sue does it all, but with the realism that at times that means making sacrifices and finding a balance. And that's why she takes the number one spot. Number 10, Black Canary. We're starting things off in the Injustice universe. This universe was spawned from the fighting game tie-in comic. So in it, the heroes are divided after Superman begins his dystopian push as he sets up the One Earth regime, a world government, helmed by Superman and those who agree with him. While those who oppose this are set up as part of an underground rebellion. Of the heroes who oppose him, you of course have who you would expect, Batman and also Green Arrow, Batman Light, and Black Canary. Don't yell at me, it's fine, it's true, it's fine. When hanging out in the Arrow Cave, Harley Quinn, who at this point has had a change of heart and is helping Green Arrow by doing things like renaming his Arrow Cave the Quiver, gets into a fight with Black Canary. And the two are fighting quite intensely until Black Canary suddenly doubles over asking for a bucket, because fictional pregnancies are usually far more dramatic than real ones. Fun fact, for a lot of women, if you are experiencing morning sickness which leads to vomiting, which not all women do, it usually happens at the same time each day, so you can kind of plan your life accordingly. It's also not always in the morning. Just life facts for the comic I'll never write, featuring a realistic boring pregnancy. So she gets the bucket, throws up in it, and Harley figures out that she's pregnant, and the two bond over it, for Harley has been pregnant in this universe as well. Harley would go on to babysit their child and be a great friend to their family. Number 9. Hawk Girl, DCAU. This is an implied pregnancy. Still counts. So in the DC animated universe, Hawk Girl and Green Lantern John Stewart had a deep relationship. It was a huge part of their arcs. The build up to it took seasons and was a huge final moment. And also the moment when her helmet was taken off and she was revealed to be gorgeous, I've never recovered. However, their love was shattered when she was revealed to be a traitor, a scout for the Thanagarian invasion force. That puts a damper on any relationship, even if she would defect to save her new friends. For some, that just made her a traitor twice over. But her and John still clearly had feelings for each other, and in a Batman Beyond episode, it was hinted that they would have a child. This was also hinted in a time travel episode in Justice League Unlimited. This is because Warhawk of that team in the future was their son, but he didn't reveal anything when he went back in time because he didn't want to mess with it, even if it meant he didn't exist. You see? That's how you time travel. Number 8. Superwoman Reach, reach, reach. She is super low, pun intended, because well, she is from Earth 3, the crime syndicate Earth, where the heroes are villains, etc. However, they don't see it that way. She would play a pivotal role in the Dark Side War arc, or rather, her pregnancy and baby would. So on her Earth, she is with Ultraman, but was also having an affair with Alexander Luther, the hero of that world. She was also cheating on both of them with Owlman, too. So when she first got pregnant, she told Ultraman it was his, but then told Owlman it was his, when really it was Maza's, who is Alexander Luther, who has the ability to absorb powers of the people he has killed, such as Billy, or on this earth, William Batson. Hence his name, Mazas, which is Shazam, backwards. So essentially what happened was she gave birth to the new dark side. This is because the baby had its father's abilities to absorb power, so it was made to absorb the Omega effect and the anti-life equation, and she died and was killed. How was this heroic? Well, this would end the war, alongside some coinciding actions. Look, they think they're heroes and they're mauled after them. You're glad you know. Come on. Number 7. Artemis. Kinda. We got put it down here because people have been baiting the net with clips for a while. We're going to be looking at Young Justice for this number. So at the end of season 2 of Young Justice, Wally West was gone and it was tragic for fans, especially as him and Artemis were a favorite couple. And what with Wally being gone from the New 52, it was all too much for some people. There was even a hashtag for a bit, Justice for Wally. It was an experience. Then Young Justice was cancelled, which was devastating for some fans, as it had ended on a bit of a cliffhanger for certain characters, like Wally. So fans started petitions and made noise, and eventually years later got the series back. Season 3 did finally bring some closure to Wally, but not entirely. However, it did provide a future vision or ideal version of the world for Artemis, and involved her and Wally together with a baby. She was down to be pregnant with Wally's baby. Stop breaking our hearts, Young Justice. Many people felt a bit more lukewarm about Season 3 though. Thoughts and feelings? Questions? Concerns? Share down below. Number 6. Bumblebee. Speaking of Young Justice, we have a more than fantasy birth here with Karen Beecher aka Bumblebee and Mal or Guardian, for a time anyway. 
life. Her and Mal were high school sweethearts who hit a bit of a rough patch when she got really invested in her work and kind of took him for granted for a bit, but they got over it. So once she was pregnant, the series used it to dive into a series of tough questions about whether or not their child would be gifted with a metagene. So if she would have this gene or not, what would it mean and did they want her to or not? Both eventualities had pros and cons. Karen would give birth in a snowstorm, only for it to be revealed that their daughter had been born with a hole in her heart, which despite just giving birth, Karen shrinks down to fix herself, all while contemplating the nature of her tech-based abilities versus meta ones. It's an interesting discussion, and a deep one, something that Young Justice enjoys doing. Number 5. Wonder Woman So Wonder Woman got pregnant by Superman. It's happened a few times actually in Elseworld or alternate universe continuity stories. We of course have the sequel to The Dark Knight Returns, The Dark Knight Night strikes again. In this we have the now infamously memed panel where her and Clark have sex up in the sky, so hard the earth shakes, and at the end of it Diana announces, wow Clark, I'm pregnant again. Quality content. However, there is a less, well, awkward pregnancy in Kingdom, which is the sequel to Kingdom Come, which is a famous Elseworlds story featuring an older crop of heroes led by Superman, who have to return to deal with new younger meta heroes who are out of control. At the end of that comic, these two, Superman and Wonder Woman, would get together, and the sequel comic Comic, she would give birth to a son who of course they named Jonathan. That's Clark's go-to name, because in so many continuities his dad is dead. In most of them by accident. There's also this panel of Wonder Woman being terrified of being pregnant by Clark in the New 52, and of course it's been cut out and using some epic thumbs, maybe even in ours. I don't know, I won't know till later. Living life on the edge. Number 4. Venom Now you could kind of consider the symbiote pregnant when it spawns, but we're going to be looking at a specific instance, and no it's not Carnage, a more recent iteration. We're going to be looking instead at Mike Costa's run, which had Eddie Brock become pregnant with Venom's baby. Yes, this was an extremely shippy run. And Donny Cates, who had come in after, hated it and made fun of shippers and is now just super aggressive to fans in general. Sad times at Twitter Hive. Eddie didn't know what was happening at first. Here he was, having weird dreams and of course throwing up. And Venom was all, no, nah, don't worry about it, it's all fine. Venom needed the bond this time to be able to spawn. And once Eddie found out, he was super protective of it. And he was keen to make sure the new symbiote was spawned safely. Now everybody was hunting Eddie down, saying this new child was a threat. I mean, look at all the other symbiotes that have been created because of Venom and then the spawn of Venom. But it all seemed to be for nothing as the symbiote was stillborn. But psych, that wasn't true. It lived and has been growing, kidnapped at first by its host. The true child of Venom was meant to be raised up into a hero. They say true. That's why I kind of said it like there were quotes around it. True. Number three, the Scarlet Witch. Ah, the tale of the Scarlet Witch's children. As much a canonical one as a tale of how some writers on staff hated her in the Vision together. Now Wanda was married to the Vision, who is a synthzoid. So how did this happen? Magic. Yes, they said it was magic. A magical pregnancy. So we would get to have all those traditional pregnant panels with her and Vision, and also get to have the concept that they were his kids. Now later, these kids would be retconned out of existence, only to be retconned back in. Her being pregnant was a big plot point. The whole relationship was. It was all planned out, and as a result, someone's staff just got sick of it, especially if they had only been lukewarm on the idea in the first place. The realization that her children had been a manifestation of her own powers would greatly degrade Wanda's mental state, and she would later have a breakdown of epic proportions, first creating the House of M universe and then nearly wiping out all mutants. Later there would be a lost children arc, where Wiccan and Speed would believe themselves to be her lost displaced children and seek her out. And they were indeed Vision's children. Just why? It didn't have to be like this. Number 2. Donna Troy Donna Troy, aka Wonder Girl, aka Troya, aka Darkstar, aka Leave Her Origin Alone. At one point she was married to a man named Terry Long. Terry was a married college professor who met and fell in love with Donna, leaving his wife, well ex-wife and child for her. Thus would begin a whole Donna balancing being a hero and a normal life arc. Donna would become pregnant quickly, and then a group of teen titans would come from the future to kill her baby. This was because he was going to grow up to become a villain called Lord Chaos. Yup. But Lord Chaos also came back to make sure that his his mom gave birth to him, and she did, and named the baby Robert. And at that point, the writers seemed to realize, oh no, they'd written themselves into a corner of sorts. So Donna would leave her life as a superhero to raise Robert, but would eventually be lured back in after a series of supervillain attacks. This would drive a wedge between her and her husband, so he would decide to take the baby and leave, and the two would end up getting divorced. But this was another problem. Divorce wasn't that acceptable at the time. A divorced hero? Who could relate to that? Asked the late 80s. And so they fixed it by having him and the baby and the wife all die in a car crash. Isn't that better than her having to deal with a reality many people live of blended families? The 80s thought so. Number 1. Elastigirl 
That's right, time to look outside of Marvel and DC to the movie The Incredibles and the awesome hero and mom Elastigirl, who had three kids with Mr. Incredible, and who the internet feels is dummy thick. Them thighs, that's what they say. Her and Mr. Incredible met at the height of their superhero careers, and it was only shortly after that that superheroes would be outlawed because of the lawsuits and the payouts they were causing the city. Helen Parr would at first be more accepting of the changes in their lives, settling into suburbia, but she too would feel the lure of their former heroic life, a lure that would be even more pronounced in the Incredible sequel, while the first film explored her husband's struggles, but still dealt with what she was dealing with too. It's a very honest look at middle age and deciding to accept your life or change it. I don't know. I love the Incredibles. Number 10, Starfire. I know some of you have been yelling, where is Starfire? We are working our way up to it. Today we're going to be looking at the Starfire from the alternate universe situated in Kingdom Come, the same one where Wonder Woman and Superman got together. I saw your puns for that too. I see you. Kingdom Come is of course the 1996 miniseries that dealt with a future crop of heroes needing to be reined in by Superman, after some of them end up getting out of control. In this universe, Starfire and Nightwing ended up staying together and having a child, Nightstar. And I'm sorry to say that the Star she was one of the heroes who was out of control. As many of the villains have been dispatched, a lot of the heroes are just fighting each other, kind of killing time. However, she ends up seeing that they are going too far and there's just a lot of collateral damage and finds herself swayed by the mindset of the older heroes. But instead of joining Superman, she joins up with her grandfather, Batman, as a member of his new Outsiders team, which is made up of many new generation heroes. Number 9. Golden Age Black Canary There were some interesting things that happened in between the Golden and Silver Ages, and one of those things is that the Golden Age Black Canary is the mother of the Silver Age one, and they both hailed originally from Earth 2. Earth 2 is the first parallel Earth, the cornerstone of the multiverse. The Flash of Two Worlds is the first story of the multiverse that would establish that this Earth was moving in tandem with the Silver Age, but further forward in time. So heroes had emerged earlier on the Golden Age Earth, as they had in real life. It was a little meta. As a result, this Earth was producing legacy characters, and Black Canary was one Dina Drake Lance, and she fought crime alongside her detective husband, Larry Lance. The two would have a daughter, Dina Laurel Lance, who would join the JSA, and eventually would make her way over to Earth 1, that being the main Earth in engaged in the Silver Age. This was to be with Oliver Queen, Green Arrow. These two Earths would cross over enough that some of the characters on them were friends, and in this case, love interests. I mean, would you just leave your Earth for Mr. I was trapped on an island? Let me know down below. Number 8. Crystal and Quicksilver Crystal is a member of the Inhumans, a princess who like all Inhumans developed her abilities after being exposed to the Terrigen Mist. She is the sister of Medusa, queen of the Inhumans, and as a result also has amazing hair. She would end up developing a romance and deep love with Quicksilver, the twin of Wanda Maximoff and former son of Magneto cause you know, retcons. Horrible retcons. She would be featured alongside him often. In this period in Marvel history, there was a lot of build up put into the romances, spanning multiple books and years. The editors wanted them to be very firmly established. She would eventually marry Quicksilver and have a daughter with him named Luna. However, their relationship would suffer when she had an affair with Scarlet Witch and Vision's next door neighbor, some guy named Joe. Allegedly because Pietro was mistreating her. But it's okay, this was all mind control makes it better? Luna would remain a character and has had plots all her own, like being forcibly exposed to Terrigen Mist. Number 7. Jean Grey Hopping timelines once more to look at Jean Grey in the Days of Future Past storyline, not Madeline when she had Cable. I know they're clones, but they're different people. Clone rights for all clones. Marvel really needs that. So this all occurs on Earth 811, and Rachel, the daughter of Jean Grey, would be kidnapped and brainwashed, and she would be turned into the Hound, a mutant who hunts down other mutants. As in this future, the Mutant Registration Act had turned dystopian after the assassination of Senator Robert Kelly. Well, more dystopian. For a time, she would remain under Ahab's control that being the people who kidnapped her, but her psychic power would link her with her victims, which would break the control they had over her. Some interesting things then happened, like her being displaced and sent to the main timeline, where she learned that there, her mom was dead, and that her dad was married to someone who looked just like her mom and was having a baby with her. It was all a bit of a shock, because she was like, oh no, I was the firstborn, me, then Nate because she's Nate Gray's sister. Number 6. Silk Spectre Now it's time to look at The Watchmen, the famed superhero deconstruction by Alan Moore, and it has become a must read for comic and graphic novel fans. Here we have the equivalent of a golden age hero in Silk Spectre, a hero in it largely for the glory, the fame, and to further her career goals. Years later she would settle down and have a child named Lori, who she would manage and push in a very stage mommy style way to become Silk Spectre 2 and carry on her legacy. One of the interesting things here is who Lori's father is. Back in the heyday of superhero teams, her mother had nearly been 
by nihilistic dark anti-hero the comedian, but had been saved. However, years later, the two had gotten together consensually at some point, and Laurie had been conceived. It's such a fascinating and raw thing, and something that sometimes happens because life is complicated, not black and white. That's one of the great things about The Watchmen, the nuance, and how it treats you as intelligent by giving you the breathing room to decide how you feel about things. It's something that makes it unique. Not many works have the confidence to do that. Just stand there and be like, interpret me. Too many people are worried people will interpret it. Raw. Which I mean, maybe he should have been a little concerned given some of the spin-offs. I see you HBO. Silk Spectre, superhero, stage mom. Number five, Kitty Pride, the brood. Ah yes, the famous thumbnail for part two. No, it was not a scene from a long lost hentai, but rather a plot arc, wherein some X-Men were impregnated by the brood. In this case, we're looking at Kitty. The brood are an insectoid species in the Marvel verse who must lay their eggs inside hosts to breed, and they love the terror that brings out in their hosts. They're a very sadistic species. As if everything eventually is allowed to follow through gestation, the host will become brood, aware the whole time the transformation is taking place. So let's talk Kitty. Kitty broke up with Colossus and returned to Charles' dream alongside Wolverine to open up the Jean Grey school for higher learning. Then, four issues into Wolverine and the X-Men, she wakes up pregnant. Like, big pregnant, like a sim. However, instead of just blindly congratulating her because they're not the Avengers, the X-Men spring into action because that's not normal, or okay, and they quickly figure out that this is a brood infestation, and so they are able to halt the transformation and abort the brood egg. It involves a lot of pregnant kitty running around her underwear. I've seen the fan art, so for those of you who will, you're welcome. You know who you are. Number four, Witchblade. So, the Witchblade. Cliff Notes version. It's a sentient gauntlet empowered by the forces of light, Angelus, in the universe. It hops from host to host, locked in an eternal battle with the darkness, the embodiment of, well, darkness and nothing, who also travels via host, always male. While the Witchblade is a bit more flexible, before a time they had a male-female thing going on, which resulted in the first host, Sarah Prezi, being impregnated by the darkness's host, Jackie Estacado. This happened while Sarah was in a coma, and he did it to try and sway the balance and influence the Witchblade. The darkness has a weird weird love-hate relationship with the forces of light. Angelus, yeah. And sometimes it leads to impregnating ladies in comas. Here's the thing, before you go full squick, neither of them knew this at the time? Better? Sarah would give birth to a daughter named Hope, and her life would be saved by the Witchblade when she experienced complications with the pregnancy. Number three, Rocket from DC. Rocket, the DC version, Rachel, was a sidekick to the character Icon and hailed from a very crime-ridden area. However, shortly after she began her adventures as a superhero, she discovered she was pregnant by her ex-boyfriend. She decided that she would have the baby and give birth to a son, Amistad Augustus Irvin, hence making her a teen mom, and it was handled very tastefully. After a period away, Rachel would return to her adventures as Rocket and find a way to balance both. She's a character who kind of fell by the wayside, but those who remember her do so fondly. Number two, Adam Eve. Adam Eve comes to us from Robert Kirkman's Invincible comic series. Adam Eve was created to be a weapon, and yet turned out to be a very nice teenage girl and eventually woman, even with her extreme intelligence and powers. After having a crush on the lead hero Invincible for years, the two would eventually get together, and she would find herself pregnant and not be thrilled, as Mark, Invincible, was spending so many long periods of time in space. She would eventually have the baby, and while well, Invincible is... It's a complicated comic. Kirkman lets the plot go where he wants, so a lot of things will just happen. Parallel dimensions, timeline skips, everything. And sometimes plots are dropped, never to return to or return to years later. But the relationship between Eve and Mark for some is an anchor, and many were happy to see them start a family together. Number one, Siren and Jamie Madrox. So Jamie Madrox is the multiple man, a mutant who can create duplicates of himself. And over the years, the nature of these duplicates has been explored. So one night, Jamie split himself into two, and when he woke up, he discovered that he and his dupe, as they are called, had had sex with Siren and Monet separately, and neither was aware that he had split and thought they had full Jamie. And Jamie didn't remember much because he had gotten blackout drunk. Siren, who most often hangs out with the X-Men, ended up pregnant during this night of passion, and she decides to keep it, and her and Jamie decide to give it a go. And for a while, it all seems okay. She goes into labor, he proposes to her while it's happening, because timing, what's that? But then things start to go wrong. They need to do an emergency C-section. The baby is blue, not breathing properly. But after drama and your kidnap plot and everything, it all seems okay. Siren held her baby, named him after her dead father, and then passed him to Jamie. And then it all goes horribly wrong and I'll never recover. 
The baby started being reabsorbed into his body. He had gotten his facts wrong. He had slept with Monet and his copy had been with Siren. Hence the baby was a copy, not real. It was a part of him. And so when he touched it, he reabsorbed it, erasing the baby from existence. As you can imagine, that was the relationship ender. My heart. Number 10, Gal Gadot filming Wonder Woman. So this is low for obvious reasons, because she's the actress who plays Wonder Woman, not actually Wonder Woman. But they did have her and Linda Carter come to the UN when they were gonna make Wonder Woman an ambassador to it. And then people got mad, like they didn't stand for the ceremony, they turned around saying it was taken away from real women who contributed, so they undid it. It was a thing, there was drama. Anyway, while she was filming Wonder Woman, she was five months pregnant, and they just masked it, and without having her hold large boxes or sit down a lot. That's the classic way. Just fun fact, being pregnant doesn't mean you you can't do stuff. You can't do as much, like at the end. But if it's good during it, you can still do a lot. Like whatever you could do before, you can still do it. So like if you were active, you can still be active. I'm really passionate about this topic. Also, not all people get huge. Some you can barely tell. Anyway, just share it. The more you know. Moving on. Number nine, She-Hulk. This is an off-panel pregnancy, but we know that it happened and more than once. In Old Man Logan, we have a future where villains have won after successfully banding together and taking out most of the heroes. Mysterio tricked Wolverine into murdering all the X-Men, which she was able to do. Just go with it. So Bruce Banner, aka the Hulk, would seemingly go mad as the exposure to radiation began to work on his mind. And he too would end up as one of the villains who divide up America into territories. And Wolverine lives in his territory, under the control of and patrolled by the Hulk gang, descendants of the She-Hulk and the Hulk, because he took her as his mate to create more Hulk babies. It's incest because they're cousins. Lots of incest Hulk babies. People tend to know about this one because it comes up a lot. Number eight, Dazzler. Yes, Dazzler, the disco queen herself, was pregnant. She got pregnant by Longshot, who was pretty excited about it. And it was hinted that their baby was Shatterstar. Let me explain. Okay, let's go through this. Dazzler and Longshot became lovers when they were both on Genosha, and they were later together on Mojo World. So what happened with this baby? Well, for a while it looked like a miscarriage. But then, that makes editorial uncomfortable. So they dealt with it with a memory loss plot where Dazzler would return to Earth before Longshot and forget him and the babies. Baby, what baby? We would fully deal with this in X Factor 47 with different timelines and time jumps. Just like we did for Sue Storm. Dead children are too real. Fix it with time travel. So Shatterstar would teleport to a time where Dazzler and Longshot were married and they give birth to a young Shatterstar. And Shatterstar erased their memories of this event so the baby could be raised to become the Shatterstar he needs Needs to be. Paradox is better than miscarriage, says Marvel. Number seven, Knockout. Knockout starts off as a villain and often squared off against Superboy Connell, the 90s one, pre black t shirt, still got the glasses and the sad belt. Free Lex Dad. She would end up on the Secret Six team and enter a lesbian relationship with fellow member and daughter of Vandal Savage, Scandal Savage. And she would also soften and become more of an anti hero. Eventually, her and Scandal would decide they wanted to have a child alongside their other partner because they were in a polyamorous relationship. So, who was there to donate his essence? Catman. Catman was chosen because he was a good friend to them, especially Scandal. And he earned that title once more when he accepted. Catman. He'll donate you his sperm. He'll make you eggs late at night. He'll go on a murder spree if your son is kidnapped. Stand up guy. Na 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 Catman. Number six. Isabel Kane, Smasher, or Izzy Kane. She became a hero to honor her grandfather and would be recruited by Captain America to join the Avengers. She got pregnant by accident when she slept with Cannonball. And just while well, neither were as thorough in the prevention department as they could have been. Right after, she would be called to return to Shi'ar homeworld, where she would decide to tell Cannonball and keep the baby. After she moves to Chandelar, in order to not have the baby interfere too much with the plot, the baby was hypergestated and was born in less than eight months. So when she came back to Cannonball, she was just like, here you go, baby. That's one way to not have to deal with it. Hyper age baby. Number five, Wolf Spain. She got pregnant via the Asgardian Himrahari, hard to say. She was on X-Force, but would return to X-Factor after the pregnancy, which would dedicate a lot of time to it, allowing it to kind of play out. And yet many people miss it. Initially, her pregnancy was threatening her life, and the Wolf Prince would give his life so that the baby and her could live. Now, this pregnancy would also be faster than normal. They would just linger on it more narratively. This would be because of the lupine natures of her and the father. The birth of this baby would also be odd. She would give birth through her mouth, and the baby would instantly get up and attack. This terrified her and she would disown her child as unnatural. The irony of this from a mutant was not fully explored, but I appreciate the nuance, unintentional as it was. She would abandon her son and Jack Russell, aka Werewolf by Night, would take him in. And she would feel terrible and the writers would demonstrate this by having her eat ice cream till she threw up. Well handled. She would later go to try and find her son and well, all the X-Men have been rebooted now thanks to Hickman. So yeah, also she died before that and she's back. 
There's a lot of things happening. Number four, Storm. So let's go over the Black Panther annual number one. This story involves the Watcher looking over the Earth and extrapolating possible timelines. In one, he sees the union of Storm and T'Challa leading to a dynasty. Guess he didn't get the no marriage memo. This dynasty would rule the world. Her and T'Challa would have children. She would become like a Game of Thrones style mom, arranging matches and talking about how her children were her cubs and how cousins used to get married to preserve dynasties. We also get an interesting alternate or revisionist history and uh, it's still from an American American perspective, so it would be different, obviously, if it was from an African perspective. So you have different acknowledgments of different things. Just read it for yourself and see how you feel. The story is called Black to the Future. It's trying hard in so many ways and failing in certain others. She convinces her one son, who loves his brother's fiance, to abandon it because it's not what's best for the people. I've read this annual more than once and it's complex. Anyway, Storm and T'Challa. Many. Number three, Rogue. Rogue has a child with Captain America in the What If story from What If Volume 2, number 114 in 1998. In this story, the Avengers went to Battleworld and Secret Wars, but never came back. Instead, they had to live there forever. They started a whole new world in society. And the process, Rogue and Cap got together and had a child, Sarah Rogers. But what about Rogue's abilities, you say? Yeah. What about them? Well, also in this story, everybody's calling Rogue Carol, which adds a disturbing question in this universe. Was the transfer total? Is it just Carol's consciousness in there? Is that why her powers don't work? I have questions and the 90s doesn't have enough answers for me. Tell me things, Watcher. I need answers. Number two, Nova. There has been more than one Nova. For our purposes, we're looking at Eve Bakian, who joins the Nova Corps to prevent the Annihilation Wave. Before this, though, she would be serving and pregnant, like full on pregnant and taking on enemies. They're doing the whole, it's fine. She has armor on. It's not like if she falls, they would just, you know, crush and kill her baby. Look at this magic armor. She looks cool. She does look cool, actually. You have to be careful, though. Filming a movie with stunt doubles is not the same as fighting invaders. She would have a daughter named Anwen, who would grow up resentful of the core because it would take her mother away from her. Indeed, Eve would end up trapped inside the soul gem, and Anwen would have to use the stone to visit her. See, in the comic verse, even children can wield the Infinity Gauntlet. Take that, MCU Tony. I'm sorry. I love you, 3000. And in at number one, we have Natasha Romanoff, Black Widow. So in the Marvel animated movies verse, Natasha marries Captain America and they have a son, James Rogers. In honor of Bucky, can you tell this is a very different continuity? Not only has Nat not been sterilized, but they're naming their son after Bucky, who in comic canon is her ex-lover. Love it. James made the leap into comics and shield number four with the next Avengers. Ah, the multiverse. Also, James is not their only child, but he follows in their heroic footsteps. Hence, he's the one who gets the glory and a special shield from Tony. Number 10, Power Girl. One of the weirdest pregnancies in probably all of comics history, which is why this one takes our bottom spot. I'm just like, it's not that great, so we're putting it at 10, but it's an interesting story, so if you haven't heard of it yet, I mean, hold on, because this is a wild ride. Power Girl became miraculously pregnant, and when other heroes inquired as to how this happened and who the father was, it was revealed that as far as Power Girl knew, there was no father because she was still a virgin. Huh? We later learned that this pregnancy was a result of Power Girl coming into contact with her grandfather, who granted her this immaculate conception so that she could give birth to a champion who would help to defeat an ancient and unstoppable evil. The champion baby grows up rapidly after it's born, is never really named by Power Girl, but is constantly referred to as baby, which is weird, and basically accuses her of being an overbearing mother before defeating the evil and leaving forever. Oh yeah, also the demon who the baby was destined to defeat was apparently the father. Yeah. It was a time. Number nine, Black Canary. In Injustice, it was revealed that Black Canary was pregnant, which actually inspired a bit of camaraderie between her and oftentimes villain Harley Quinn. Harley even revealed that she too was actually a mother and had Joker's child, but kept it a secret from the Clown Prince of Crime because she was likely worried for the child's safety and also didn't want to distract Mr. J. When Black Canary's son was born, Harley even came to visit Dinah at the hospital, posing as her sister in Injustice, Gods Among Us, year two. To issue 15 to deliver presents for the little newborn. Weird presents, of course, because hey, this is Harley Quinn, but still, the gesture was pretty comical and pretty sweet. And friends, before we move on to our next spot, just a quick reminder to give this video a thumbs up if you're enjoying it, and make sure to click that subscribe if you haven't already. Number eight, Batgirl. Batgirl Barbara Gordon has been pregnant in a few different continuities and alternate timelines. In fact, one of my favorite pregnancies for her is one she shared with Dick Grayson. I love Barbara and Dick together personally, so I like the Earth 2 New 52 
new version of their story where they ended up together and had a son. Sadly, Barbara ends up dying while fighting to protect her family, and in this reality, Dick ends up becoming Oracle. Their son John grows up to become Robin and joins the Earth 2 superhero team, The Wonders of the World. There is also another alternate reality where Barbara ends up pregnant with Bruce's child, which is. Yeah, a lot less my favorite. This happens while Dick is away and the revelation destroys his and Barbara's relationship. The pregnancy does not come to full term as Barbara suffers a miscarriage due to the strain of fighting crime. Number 7. Spoiler Another pregnancy that I think was an interesting story which gave us tons of character development was spoilers. Stephanie Brown discovered that she was pregnant after she would broken up with her boyfriend Dean. Fortunately, she had found the best and most supportive friend she could ask for in Tim Drake. Stephanie decided to give birth to the baby but gave her up for adoption, something I don't think we see as often explored in the comics personally. Stephanie believed this would give her daughter the best shot at life, even though it was a very hard decision for her to ultimately make. I think this pregnancy story is a great one just in terms of what it did for both Tim and Stephanie's relationship, bringing them closer together, and for revealing more about what kind of people they each were. Because they were kind of just, yeah, they're both just kind of cool characters, and I feel like we got to know them a bit better through that story. Number 6. Shadow Shadow is more on the side of villain most of the time, but she has helped out Oliver Queen before, teaming up with him to fight Count Vertigo in the New 52 continuity, and so for that, we're going to count her as an anti-hero for the purpose of this list. Previous to the Prime Earth continuity, her alignment was a little more ambiguous and that version of Shadow also got pregnant, but only after it was implied at least that she assaulted Oliver Queen to do so, taking advantage of him while he was unconscious and in her care. Although really it depends on what you're reading as opposed to how you want to take that whole interaction because yeah, it's a weird retconned, unretconned, retcon thing. In the prime Earth continuity, things are a lot cleaner. She becomes pregnant with Robert Queen's child and gives birth to Amiko Queen, who instead grow up to be Red Arrow and Oliver Queen's half sister. Weirdly enough, in the new Earth continuity, she actually named her and Oliver's son Robert. So when you're looking at both these continuities, it's seems very confusing. Welcome to DC, where there are many continuities and they're all confusing. Number 5. Wonder Woman Wonder Woman has become pregnant as well across a few different continuities and alternate timelines, one of the more notable ones in my mind being in Kingdom Come. Here she becomes pregnant with Superman's child, they have a son together, and ask Batman to become the godfather of their child and also to help them raise him. In the end it would be revealed that their son would actually grow up to be the guardian of hyper time, the time traveling hero known as Hyperman. Their son, like many of Superman's other sons, across the continuities and alternate timelines of DC would be named Jonathan Kent. There are so many Jonathan, John Kents, so many of them from different <laughs> realities. Number 4. Hippolyta I personally love the version of Wonder Woman's origins with her being a daughter made out of clay. But of course, as time changes, so do characters' origins. Especially at DC, where it feels like origins are deemed outdated once every decade, and as such kind of end up getting some kind of refresh to them. One such story is the creation of Diana. In the Prime Earth continuity, it was revealed that Hippolyta fell in love with a man who she believed was worthy of her, but he wasn't actually just a man, he was a god. The god, in fact, Zeus. She became pregnant with his children and gave birth to a daughter, Diana, and a son, Jason. When she learned that this man was Zeus, she decided to create a cover story for her daughter and give away her son in order to basically protect both of them. Hence the story we all know of still existing in this reality, but as a cover instead of a truth that Diana was made from clay. Hippolyta did this to protect her children, Themyscira, and herself from the wrath of Zeus's wife, the often jealous Hera. At least often jealous in mythology. Not as familiar with Hera in the comics, so. But in the. In the myths, she's very jealous a lot. Number 3. Mara One of the most sweet pregnancies in DC Comics, especially in recent years. Mara and Aquaman got pregnant in the previous continuity and it didn't work out so great with that Aqua baby, Arthur Curry Jr., living a far, far too short life and being taken from his parents by the Aquaman villain, Black Manta. This ended up causing a rift between the parents who would eventually divorce because of their child's demise. However, this time around, Mara and Aquaman had a baby girl and it seems 
this version of the story is getting a much happier ending. Well, so far at least. With their daughter Andy Curry growing up to become Aquawoman in DC's future state. And with Aquaman and Mera tying the knot in the current continuity in issue 65 of the most recent Aquaman run, which started in 2016. I gotta say, I love both Arthur and Mera as parents to this cute little bean. I love Andy Curry, she's so cute. Number 2. Rocket Rocket is definitely one of the notable pregnant superheroes in all of DC Comics history. She is from the Dakotaverse and Milestone imprint, which is gearing up to be relaunched by DC later this year. She had an accidental teen pregnancy, but after learning she was pregnant, wanted to keep the baby. Both her mother and the father of the child, her ex-boyfriend Noble, encouraged her to abort the pregnancy, but she decided against doing so and ended up giving birth to a son, whom she named in part after her superhero partner and role model, Icon. Her son was named Amistad Augustus Irvin. Rocket became a Milestone character not just for Milestone, but for comics overall, and is often noted as the first single teen mother superhero in comic book history. Number 1. Catwoman Catwoman has had a few pregnancies actually across other continuities and alternate Earths. She had a daughter named Helena, who was the result of a one night stand with Sam Bradley Jr., but due to the time skipping event of one year later, we didn't really get to see how most of her pregnancy played out, instead skipping ahead to when Selena's baby girl was delivered. Catwoman would go so far as to fake hers and her daughter's death to ensure their safety, all with the help of the Bat family of course. But even then, it wasn't enough, and in the end, Selina actually had to give up Helena. Recently, in Catwoman's 80th anniversary, we got a glimpse into the pregnant life and child rearing of the daughter that Catwoman had with Batman in an alternate timeline of Tom King's, where Batman and Catwoman ended up as a married, crime-fighting duo, which I love. And that story titled Helena, because yeah, this version of the daughter is also named Helena, is about as adorable and tear inducing as you can imagine. Also, if you haven't read the 80th anniversary of Catwoman yet, you should definitely go back and read that. There's lots of cool stuff in there. Kicking off the list at number 10. Miss Marvel. So back in the 80s, Marvel had this storyline where Miss Marvel got pregnant from Marcus Immortus. Now, it wasn't a fan favorite by any means because this wasn't a consensual relationship. And when Carol was going through this pregnancy, the Avengers were just like, hey, congrats, we're not gonna ask any questions, go team. Yeah, this is a horrible event in comics in every way. So in Avengers 197, the issue has right on the front cover, Miss Marvel's shocking surprise. And then after her and Wanda have a heart to heart about Wanda wanting to have kids, Carol suddenly gets really sick and in the last few pages of that issue, it's revealed she's somehow pregnant. Three months pregnant. Then the next day, six months pregnant. So something's going on. Even the doctor is like, well I have no idea why she's so upset. Nausea and fainting are common symptoms while being pregnant. Like thanks doc, way to use your ears about the whole situation that I just explained. Good work. And then in Avengers issue 200, her teammates are just as useless and awful about the whole situation yet again. Even Cap acknowledges that Carol insists that she doesn't know who the father is and that there's no way that there even is a father in the first place. Yet the team continues to act normal. They're like, ooh, did I miss it? Oh, he's so cute. Just the worst, the absolute worst. Especially because this happens right after Wanda explains herself wanting children. Like this whole act of mental and bodily violation is a good thing. So what happened after? Well, as the child grows rapidly, the team acts like she's being the odd one here, when she's just trying to cope with this trauma. So when she goes to visit her son, his name is Marcus and he's already a full grown adult. So before this, Marcus was trapped in limbo, and in order to get out, he used Carol to give birth to himself so he can finally be free. So after they transport her back to her reality, she gives birth to him, and then he grows up rapidly, goes against the Avengers, loses, and then gets banished back into limbo. Chris Claremont tried to retcon this horrible story with Avengers Annual Issue 10, where it's treated as an act of violation rather than a superhero miracle. And before we continue on with this list, guys, if you could go ahead and give this video a thumbs up, because it really does wonders for our channel. You guys are the best. Thank you so much. Now back to some more pregnancies. Number nine, Susan Storm. Better known as the Invisible Woman, Susan Storm made her debut in comics in Fantastic Four issue one back in 1961. So in Fantastic Four annual issue three, we see the wedding with her and Reed Richards, AKA Mr. Fantastic, AKA Stretchy Boy, and shortly after a pregnancy was in the picture. So when Sue was pregnant, Crystal of the Inhumans came and took her spot on the team. When the child was on the way, they had to travel to the negative zone and then borrow the cosmic control rod of Annihilus. So not your average C-section this time around. And then out pops Franklin Richards. See, Franklin is quoted from Galactus himself as the most powerful mutant 
ever. He is a mutant beyond Omega power, he was a member of Gen X, and he's also a future X-Men member in the Ultimate X-Men comics. Some of his powers include vast reality warping, psionic powers, precognitive powers, so his dreams tip him off on what's going to happen in real life. He's just a splendid human being. He can see the future in his dreams also, and he can resurrect the dead, time travel, teleport, astral project, and he can duplicate planets and or people. So not too shabby at all. Number 8. Wanda Maximoff One of the biggest turning points for Wanda in the MCU is of course during the events of WandaVision, which we all watched, right? Just like the comics, Wanda gives birth to two twins, Billy and Tommy. Now as we saw in the show, these kids were created using Wanda's magic. Now the loss of her sons is what caused the events of House of M to unfold. And with Wanda reading up on chaos magic with the Book of the Damned at the end of WandaVision, we can assume something similar is going to happen on screen in some way. So Billy, aka Wiccan, gained the abilities of magic just like his mother, and Tommy, aka Speed, has, well, super speed, which you probably could have guessed. Just like Wanda's brother, Pietro, aka Quicksilver, aka Ralphie B. So I hope we see more of these super kids in the show because they were so fun to watch. They can't be gone, I refuse to admit it. Nor Quicksilver. Number seven, Kyra Oldstrong. He was born to the shadow people of Sakaar and she was one of the few members of her race that had something called old power. My Uncle Scott also has old power, just raw strength, you know? I shake his hand and I can just feel my knuckles moving around like marbles. But no, no, this, this old power is much, much stronger. Sorry, Uncle Scott. See, originally she was saved by the Red King. Well, rather, the Red King stood by and let her village get infected in order to find a shadow with the old power. And it worked, and he found Kyra, imprisoned her, and then he made her his bodyguard. So when the Hulk came around, she was in charge of watching over him during his training. So eventually the two teamed up, took down the Red King, Hulk became the new King of Sakaar, and he even chose Kyra as his wife instead of her being, you know, a bodyguard and all. And then it didn't take long for her to inform Hulk about a child, a baby. Meet Scar. He made his debut in World War Hulk issue five after the Hulk had left the planet. Scar had popped out of a cocoon and he resembled a teenager after just one year. Boys drinking his milk, oh, they grew up so fast. Now, given the fact that he was born on a not so chill planet, he learned to fight to survive. Scar retains the old power as well, so he has the ability to control tectonic energy, so he can summon lava and also tap into energy projection. Number six, Jessica Jones. It all started 15 years ago. Jessica Jones was attending Midtown High, where she actually shared a few classes with Peter Parker. She actually had a crush on him at one point, but I mean, hey, who didn't? Her father had tickets from Tony Stark, and those tickets were for a family trip to Disney World. On the way home, the family was in a car accident where Jessica was exposed to chemicals and then laid in a coma for months. She was also tragically the only survivor. The chemicals gave her superpowers like strength and durability. And then she began a career as a detective and met Luke Cage at his bar and the two hit it off. In Alias issue 28, Luke Cage approaches Jessica and he tells her that he has feelings for her, that he's been thinking about her quite a bit actually, more than he was willing to admit himself. Then she responds with, I'm pregnant and Luke Cage is indeed the father. So he gives a big smile and says, all right then, New chapter. So meet Danny Cage. She is adorable and she has a pretty cool nanny as well. That nanny being Squirrel Girl. Number five, Jessica Drew, AKA Spider Woman. She made her first debut in Marvel Spotlight issue 32 and in volume six issue five, Jessica got pregnant through an artificial insemination. And here's the best part. She still fought crime in a way. She used Ben Urich and the Porcupine to help her investigations while she worked out the hashtag mom life. So Jerry, her son, was actually born during a scroll invasion from a hospital in a black hole. I was born in Ajax. Just as cool. Talk about a super birth. So we had the powers too, of course, which are super speed, super strength, the whole package from Jessica. And then Jessica kicked the scrolls while she was waiting to give birth. It's so amazing. So after she had returned, she was finding it difficult to return to the superhero life. All she could think about was little Jerry. So she figured the best thing to do would just be to teach him how to be a hero himself. Number four, Kitty Pride. This one is pretty wild, okay? So during Wolverine and the X-Men issue four, Kitty is shocked at the fact that she is eight months pregnant, just out of the blue. Well, she thought she was pregnant, really. What actually happened was that her uterus had contained these brood drones that were attacking her from inside her body. So the X-Men fought back magic school bus style and shrank down really small to get a closer look. I would have been Arnold in that situation. I knew I should have stayed home. Boo, Miss Frizzle, I have a tummy ache. It looks far too intense. They're like near the brain too. I would just wanna, I wanna poke it. I would not wanna touch anything brain-like in my life. That sounds kinda 
Serial killerish. Now at this time, Kitty was the headmistress of the Jean Grey school, and while they were fighting in there, Kitty had to fight off adult brood in real life while they invaded the school. But fear not, as Kitty was injected with Centaurian penicillin after the battle was over in order to get rid of the internal remaining brood problems she had going on. Number three, Wolfsbane. Rain Sinclair made her first appearance in Marvel graphic novel issue four back in the early 80s. So after Wolfsbane joined the X Force, she was taken and brainwashed by the purifiers. Then she met up with former her lover Prince Ramari in X-Force Volume 3, Issue 17, and they really reunited when they slept together. And then they were attacked by Frost Giants, and after the fight, Wolfsbane lost consciousness, but before so, she called out to Elixir. Ramari rushed her back to Angel's Airy, where they met Archangel in Warpath, and then they all went to the X-Men base, Utopia. Things weren't so smooth over there as well, as it was being attacked by Selene's undead mutants, and Elixir was in a coma after time traveling. So it's not looking too good of a scenario. Wolfsbane wasn't doing well health-wise still, so Hermari called Hela the goddess of death. So she has a deal to offer, a soul for a soul. Which life to save? Hmm, that's the question. So Hermari didn't choose the unborn child, nor Wolfsbane, but rather he chose Elixir, knowing that Elixir could save them both. When Rain left the X-Men, she intended on rejoining X-Factor when she rediscovered her ex, Richter, in a relationship with Shatterstar. So she told Richter that the baby was his, but then after Dr. Castillo saw they couldn't even examine the embryo with an ultrasound because it couldn't penetrate Wolfsbane's body, it was clear that Elixir had enhanced her body to ensure the safety of the Asgardian embryo inside. So this clued him in and he realized it is in fact from Hari's child. Plot twist. Number two, Tigra. Greer Grant got pregnant during the Secret Invasion storyline, but she had believed that she was in a relationship with Yellow Jacket, but near the climax of the Skrull invasion, she found out it was not the true Hank Pym that she was involved with. It was in fact a Skrull. His scroll replacement, Creedy Noel, was the father, and then this resulted in Tigra being a target of Norman Osborns, who just wanted the child for himself. So it's all bad at this point. The baby was born and it seemed healthy. I mean, it was covered in fur and all, but that's not the crazy part of this scenario, weirdly. Hank Pym was convinced that the child was his and he wanted to raise it, but Tigra wanted her child to be raised by the Society of Cat People, because anything is better than Norman Osborn in this case. Number one, Quasar. This last one is quite memorable, so here we go. So Aisha wanted to have children, but the father had to be genetically perfect. Set that bar nice and high, we love it. Somebody like Adam Warlock, for example, but he rejected the idea, so her next move was to see who was worthy. So she implanted other heroes with reproductive pods to see how they would do. And one of those hosts was Quasar. He's actually the only one that embraces it. He actually tries not to remove the pod, and he ends up fighting alongside Aisha while pregnant against Moondragon and Jack of Hearts, so Aisha removed the pod afterwards. What a test. Number 10, Harley Quinn. She's gonna go down here, cause some feel she leans more towards the anti-hero side these days, just ignore the bodies. However, in a couple of alternate timelines, she has gotten pregnant by the Joker, and in both she's given the baby up for its own good. In the Injustice verse, she would find her way back into her daughter's life without initially revealing who she was, just happy to be able to contribute. And then there was Old Lady Harley. Yes, DC did an Old Lady Harley after the resurgence in popularity of Old Man Logan post the film Logan, when people learned that it was similar and reminiscent in tone of that comic, though they oversold its similarities between the two, just a little bit. So in Old Lady Harley, her pregnancy was a big reveal. She had gotten pregnant by the Joker and had not been able to even look at the child or attach because of his father and of all that had occurred in that relationship, and so left the baby at the hospital. This would set the baby on a path of revenge against her for abandonment. It was all very dark and sad. It got way less zany than advertised at the end there. Number nine, the Huntress, the first one from the golden age. So this is Paula Brooks, who was renamed as the Tigress via retcon later on. She was married to fellow supervillain, the Sportsmaster, and in comic canon, that's where it ended. But and her young Justice canon. Here, she would have largely the same backstory, but would also have it tweaked to be the mother of two children, the villain Cheshire and the hero Artemis. Her relationship with Sportsmaster had deteriorated after she had suffered an injury that left her paralyzed and made her not want to live such a dangerous life of crime anymore, especially now that she had children. This created a whole new dynamic for the characters in the Young Justice universe. It was a cool character addition, and Paula Brooks was ripe for it because she had a lot of gaps in her backstory, ripe to be filled with drama. Number eight. 
meet Hela. So in the comics, Hela got pregnant, and it was by Thor. But before you flip a table, let me explain. So in the Marvel verse, as in myth, Hela is Loki's child. So they're not siblings there. Calm down, MCU fans. So here's the story. Thor went down to her realm to try and get Valkyrie brought back to life. And when there, Hela told him that she wanted a son, and engineered a situation where he ended up being trapped there in Valhalla, or rather, her realm. Darkness. And he ended up missing his life so much that he agreed to her terms. Provide his sperm. And this is God time, so no gestation period here. She gets pregnant and gives birth that same day to a child, Modi Thorson, who was evil and aged quite rapidly, so Thor killed him. All in a day's work for the God of Thunder. Number 7. Ink Heading over to the Batman Beyond verse in the DCAU, that being the DC animated universe for this villain. Ink is a mercenary, a woman who has undergone dramatic genetic mutation to be able to infiltrate pretty much anywhere. Her body is malleable and occupies a semi gelatinous state and is dark navy blue to black, hence her name, Ink. Years before, she had had a daughter who she had given up, but she ended up needing to call on her when she was injured, and her daughter had grown up to be a bit of a waste role with a lot of credit problems. So she used the opportunity to trick her mother, and she got her the wrong chemicals, so she would end up dissolving. And hence her daughter would get access to all of her money, her entire fortune. But because of this, she would end up earning her mother's wrath, because Ink wasn't really gone. Cold. Ice cold. Number 6. Lady Shiva. Lady Shiva is just a great name to say. Sandra Busan debuted in Richard Dragon Kung Fu Fighter number 5 in 1975. She would start off here, but find herself growing more and more associated with the Batman mythos. So let me tell you a little bit about this. We need to build up. So Sandra had a sister, Carolyn, and together they moved to Detroit after coming from a village under the control of the League of Assassins. She and her sister would practice martial arts in Detroit and be seen by an assassin, David Kane, who noticed that Sandra was holding back against her sister. So Kane would murder her sister to unlock her full potential. Sandra would hunt him down, only to discover it was a League of Assassins trap and that he was a member. When fighting, she realized that Kane had been right. Her sister had been holding her back. So she decided decided on a trade. She would give Kane a child he could raise if he spared her life and let her develop her skills to their full potential. So they would become lovers, and she would bear him that child, a child named Cassandra Kane, the girl who would find herself taken under Batman's wing as Batgirl and later Black Bat. It's all interconnected. It's all coming together. Number 5. Orca. We're going to be talking about the Grace Ballin version of this character. So Orca was a kind student who was doing experiments on spinal cord tissue regeneration using Orca's spinal cord tissue. I think you can see where this is going. This would turn her into an Orca, and she could turn back and forth. And so what's a girl to do? Go on a crime spree, of course. She goes after rich people and jerks, kind of. She's taken a bit of a Robin Hood approach. But still, this puts her in conflict with Batman. He doesn't stand for that. But she didn't get pregnant in the main verse, but in the Injustice verse, where she was a member of the Suicide Squad alongside Killer Croc. It was meant to be. They're both aquatic themed. Come on, it writes itself. They're dating and she's pregnant with his baby. True villain love. Give the people what they want. I don't even know what that is anymore. Pregnant lists. Number four, Cheshire and Catman. Cheshire was blackmailed into joining the Secret Six, a team of villains hired for specific ops. Missions that sometimes geared a bit more heroic, depending upon who was hiring them. So kind of like the Suicide Squad. While on this team, she would take up with Catman, who got a new lease on life in this series. People are taking him seriously. And she would become pregnant. But unlike her other child, who we will talk about later, she would keep this child, a son. She purposely got pregnant with this child as a way to escape the blackmail that was keeping her on the team. She was being blackmailed by Mockingbird. She would move to the Himalayan mountains with her son, Blake. However, her son would be kidnapped kidnapped, and Catman would go on a murderous rampage to save him. But he would discover that he had been given to a loving, childless couple, and so he would decide that the child would actually be better off there than with him or the mother. So he would go back and tell her that their son was dead, so that she wouldn't know to look for him. Depressing. Number 3. Mystique Mystique is a mother several times over in comics to some core characters. She would have Graydon Creed with Sabretooth. And while on her raven persona, she would marry Baron Christian Wagner and give birth to Nightcrawler. 
but not by Wagner, as he was infertile and also an unsatisfactory lover. So she would begin to have affairs, and one of them would be that she would seduce Azazel and get pregnant by him. Hence, Nightcrawler has such an extreme appearance. He would be believed to be a demon, and she would have to flee, but abandon Nightcrawler in the process. Mystique is also the adopted mother of Rogue, whom she raised with the great love of her life, the mutant Destiny. Mystique lives her life, all of it, and children come as they do. She has a bit of a different relationship with them because she is so long lived. You would attached to people differently after a while. Number two, Talia al Ghul. Talia is the daughter of Ra's al Ghul and the mother of Damian Wayne. The current at the time of this recording, Robin, or at least the most recent. The tale of the conception is one of controversy. So the idea of Batman having a biological son first originated in an Elseworld story. And when they decided they wanted it to be main continuity, they got Grant Morrison to write it. But he misremembered this first original story and thought that Talia had raped Bruce, slipping something into his drink and then sperm jacking him basically. So that was what became canon. Though it wasn't acknowledged as problematic for a while, and in some cases, still isn't. This is why you have jokes made, for example, by Damien in the animated Hush film, he's the product of the rape, telling his father, the victim, to cover his drink. High comedy. So DC would try and retcon this to make it consensual, especially when they realized it had all been a mistake. But it just keeps coming back. It's that piece of canon that just won't die. It even survived retcons. It's powerful. Will fans ever let it die? I don't know. I will if they will. Retcon it properly. And number one, Cheshire and Roy Harper. I'm sure a lot of you knew this was gonna be number one. It's iconic. The relationship between Cheshire and Speedy that results in Leanne Harper, beloved child character, who would become a recurring supporting cast member of the Titans and the Teen Titans, and just a sweetheart to have around. Cheshire would give Leanne to her father, believing that he could give her a better life than her, that she could grow to her full potential. She would grow up loved by superheroes, only to be killed in Cry for Justice as a shock kill to prove that things were really serious. And she's gone, cause the idea the idea has always been that superheroes with children are off-putting to the allegedly super young child audience. Demographics. Sure, Jan, I want to see those numbers. 